all the time. We are family. Outstanding effort again. We're busting ours to kick yours. That's big time. Minus 15. Respect all, fear none. Oh, did he felt that one? Intensity is not a perfume. It was a no downer. Five, four, three, two, one. We've got playoff baseball here at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. The Baltimore Orioles against the Texas Rangers in the American League Division Series. Hi everyone, welcome into Mass and All Access. I'm Brendan Mortensen, joined by Matt Bonaparte. Out here on the flag court with an empty Utah street in front of us. It's going to be raucous 24 hours from now, not going to be empty. We won't be able to sit here, I'll tell you that much. No, no. It's going to be impossible. It's going to be standing room only for ALDS Game 1 as the Orioles are set to face the Texas Rangers. But let's start with Texas. Let's talk about how they got here. They took down the Tampa Bay Rays in the American League Wild Card Series. The Rays, of course, won 99 games in the regular season, but we know the Rangers are a streaky team. They got hot in the playoffs and really dominated those two games against Tampa Bay. Yeah, Game 1, 4-zip, Game 2, 7-1. Uh, I mean, it was an all-out flattening from the t Texas Rangers in that game. Now, the thing I do want to point out, first and foremost, about that series is that they didn't have to be in a playoff atmosphere. There were less than 20,000 fans inside the trap. And that is not going to be the case at Camden Yards. Sean McDonough couldn't even call it a crowd. He called it a group at the trap. That is not going to be the case where we're at, okay, behind us. This is going to be a raucous crowd, uh, and Dane Dunning, who is potentially the Game 1 starter in the ALDS, is going to have to deal with that. Now, Back to those two games, they were firing on all cylinders. They got two ace-worthy starts from Jordan Montgomery and Nathan Evaldi in those games. They combined for 13 and two-thirds innings pitched, only one earned run, and 13 strikeouts between them. The Rays lineup really had nothing. They had no answers for those two pitchers. The bullpen was great as well, and they handed it over to them. Only two hits allowed. Those guys were absolutely fantastic. Five strikeouts and four and a third innings for the bullpen and no runs. So a shutout performance from the bullpen in those two games. And how about the offense? 7-1 in that second game. Corey Seager continued what's a career year for him. And Evan Carter has come out of nowhere, and he's been fantastic and was in that game, in both of them. Yeah, the Rangers really dominated the Rays, again, who had the second best record in the American League going into that wild card series. I mentioned off the top, the Rangers, a very streaky team. This is also a club that's missing Max Scherzer and Jacob deGrom out of that starting wow. pitching rotation right now. Let's talk about the Rangers' season as a whole. Where are some of their strengths and where are some of the weaknesses? So the strengths, of course, are their bats. Uh, you talked about, I spoke about Corey Seager already, having a career year, hitting up above 330 with an OPS above 1,000, 33 homers on the season, 96 RBI smack dab in the middle of their lineup. He's a force to be reckoned with this year, no doubt about it. Uh, their bats are incredible. Second overall in the majors in terms of team batting average, third in OPS, both of those good enough for first 
in the American League. So they hit anybody and everybody. They don't care who's on the mound. They're going to get their hits. They're going to get their runs. So that's going to be something uh, that the Orioles pitching staff has to deal with. Um, also, a big plus for them, they added an ace. Jordan Montgomery at the trade deadline, he has been absolutely fantastic. I don't want to say he's been exactly 2008 CC Sabathia level, but a 2.79 ERA and 11 starts, Jordan Montgomery has been everything and more for the Texas Rangers. Yeah, Jordan Montgomery, a huge addition, and you mentioned that double play combo of Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon. Going to be quite the handful to slow down this Texas Rangers offense, but luckily for the Baltimore Orioles, their star catcher has been scorching hot coming into the postseason. Yeah, Adley has been absolutely fantastic. This last month hitting 292 with an OPS just under 1,000. But the thing that strikes out to me is the walk numbers. 20 walks in that time for Adley, which is going to be hugely impressive in this series if you're going to try and get to that bullpen of the Texas Rangers. Yeah, not to be too money ball here, but he gets on base. He and does. that's what you like about Adley Rutschman. Now, of course, the benefit of the Orioles having that number one seed, getting to face the Rangers, who just had to go through the wild card series, is that the Rangers can't throw any of their best pitchers in game one here of this ALDS. They already used Nate Evaldi, already used Jordan Montgomery, which means the Orioles and Kyle Bradish have a little bit of an easier pitching matchup here. Yeah, absolutely. Dane Dunning likely on the mound for Texas this time around. Uh, but don't be surprised if they do end up throwing Gumby, Jordan Montgomery, in game two on short rest. Or I probably won't even be short rest. I feel like they have a flavor. I don't I didn't do the math here, but I feel like I could be regular rest more. Uh, they do have a very good pitching staff, but like you mentioned already, no Max Scherzer, no Jacob deGrom. It's a little bit questionable. Uh, Dane Dunning, though, he is a very good player, and he did face... The Orioles one time this year, four innings, one hit, uh, I believe no runs. He was fantastic. Uh, so Dane Dunning, a guy who's faced this team once before and has been really, really good for the right Rangers this season. Yeah, Kyle Bradish, again, going on the other side, one of the best pitchers in the American League this season. We're going to keep breaking down this game, but don't forget about what's happening down in the minor leagues. Kyle Bradish on the bump for the Orioles. He was a former top 10 prospect in the Orioles system. I take a quick look back at what the Orioles farm system has done this season. Gunnar Henderson, Adley Rutschman, and Kyle Bradish are leading the Baltimore Orioles into the American League Division Series. Henderson and Rutschman are former number one overall prospects in baseball. Kyle Bradish was a top 10 prospect in Baltimore's system. Point being, the Orioles won 101 games, but let's not forget about all the success down on the farm. But I know, I know, the action is up here. The Orioles are in the playoffs, not taking up too much of your time. We're going to put five minutes on the clock for our minor league recap. Let's start down in AAA with the Norfolk Tides. Minor League Baseball's Team of the Year won 90 games and the International League Championship. A big contributor down the stretch was, of course, Minor League Baseball's Player of the Year, Jackson Holiday. This year's gone about as, uh, as well as I could possibly imagine. Um, my goal was AA and uh, to be able to, to make it to AAA is, is quite some. You know the story by now. Just 19 years old, started in Delmarva, made it all the way up to the Tides in his first professional season. Special stuff from Jackson Holiday. We could be seeing him in Baltimore very soon. We saw the 14th ranked prospect in Baltimore for a brief stretch. Colton Kowser mashed a grand slam in the International League Championship game to help the Tides come home victorious. Struggled a bit with the O's, but hit 300 in Norfolk with a 937 OPS. Kowser will be back. And he could have a fellow top five pick in the outfield with him in Heston Kerstad. A couple of clutch hits already in the bigs for the lefty. Kerstad isn't just a cool story anymore. He's here and he's showing why he was worthy of the second overall pick. Kobe Mayo wasn't a top five pick or even a first round pick. The slugger was drafted in the fourth round back in 2020 and he's leapfrogged all the way up to the 27th ranked prospect in baseball per MLB pipeline. Well deserved too, an OPS over a thousand in 78 games in Bowie. That OPS stayed over 900 in 62 games with the Tides. He's just 21 years old with a huge future ahead. Now, speaking of former fourth round picks, Joey Ortiz just keeps doing his thing. The 50th ranked prospect in baseball hit 321 in Norfolk and plays some pretty unreal defense at shortstop. His double playmate, Connor Norby, led the International League in hits, runs, and doubles. He was second in extra base hits and third in RBIs. He hit 290, mashed 21 home runs to go along with those 40 doubles. That's some serious pop from second base. 
And on the mound, Chase McDermott won the O's Minor League Pitcher of the Year. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really just a confidence and keeping it simple kind of thing. So it wasn't too much that went into it. Yeah, McDermott should be feeling pretty confident with a 2.49 ERA in 10 games with the Tides. Last year's trade acquisition paying off big time so far. Kate Povich came over at last year's deadline too. ERA this season, not eye-popping, but the lefty struck out over 12 batters per nine innings this season. I don't get some attention. Showing us why he's the Orioles' 11th ranked prospect on their top 30. All right, still with me? We're about halfway through our time, and we've got some big names still to talk about. First and foremost, Samuel Basayo turned himself into a big name this season. He saw Jackson Holiday reaching AAA at age 19 and raised him reaching AA at age 18. Catcher hit 313 on the year. On base percentage was over 400, OPS over 950. Look, he's the 46th ranked prospect in baseball right now. That's going to be going up. In Bowie, he joined a lot of members of the 2022 draft class, led by Dylan Beavers. Yeah, I think, honestly, I feel like it's gotten easier, maybe, as I, I mean, going from Aberdeen to here, uh, the game's a little bit quicker, but I think it's easier in the aspect that there are the misses and a lot of the pitches that are thrown are a lot closer to the zone. Yeah, I still don't know how going up a level is easier, but Beavers hit over 320 with the Bay Sox, so I'll take his word for it. 14 extra base hits in 34 games. There with him, Judd Fabian and Max Wagner. Juddy Jacks got to double A first out of the trio, but struggled a bit at the dish. Still an on-base percentage right around 315, despite a batting average in the 170s. Wagner stayed pretty consistent from Aberdeen to Bowie. He's been moving all around the diamond. Billy Cook took a lot of slow trots around that diamond, 24 to be exact. This season, he became the second player in Bay Sox history to record a 2020 season. Helpful, of course, that he didn't have to face his teammate, Trace Bright, who struck out over 13 batters per nine innings across two levels of the minors. All right, two levels down. We still got one to go. Let's go down to Aberdeen, where you'll find the Orioles' first round pick from 2023 and Enrique Bradfield Jr. Or at least you can try to find him, but if you blink, you might miss him. He played 25 professional games, stole 25 bases. Now, Mac Horvath, the second round pick, might not beat Bradfield in a 40-yard dash, but he did nab 14 bases in his 22 games, along with hitting 321 with an OPS over 1,000 in his first taste of professional ball. C got in just in time. Isn't it nice when that timing works out? Kind of like when you have a stacked farm system ready to help a big league team that just won 101 games. Yeah, fun times in Baltimore, up in the bigs and down in the minors. Well, we know for the Orioles, a lot of top prospects are going to be trotting out onto the field this weekend. Gunnar Henderson at shortstop or third base, Adley Rutschman behind the dish, maybe Jordan Westberg at second base, third base as well. The Orioles, maybe more than any other team in this playoffs, they're going to be helped by that depth. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned Jordan Westberg already. How about Ryan O'Hearn and Aaron Hicks, who are also going to be huge players in this series for the Orioles as they can utilize that depth. Uh, best they can. You've got guys who can play all over the diamond, uh, but also your starters are incredibly de are incredible defensively. Ramon Urias, uh, who I don't want to say he's been an unsung hero this year, but just hasn't made as much noise as last year with that Gold Glove campaign. He's still an incredible defender on the hot corner, but like you said, you also have Jordan Westberg, who makes incredible plays at second base, third base, wherever you put him, really. And then, like I said, you have Aaron Hicks, who you can put in the outfield, a veteran outfielder with a good arm. Uh, who can play all over. So a really, really good uh, depth in terms of what the Orioles have on defense. And on the other side for the Texas Rangers, their lineup kind of thought to be a little bit top heavy, maybe, maybe carried by those stars a little bit with Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon, Adolis Garcia, Jonah Heim, Josh Young. We know all those guys, pr practically the all-star infield for that team. But really the X factor here for the Rangers in this series could be how their depth plays. Are there going to continue to be contributions from guys like Evan Carter, Robbie Grossman in the middle of that lineup as well? Yeah, those are the big question marks for the Rangers. What's that outfield position going to look like? You mentioned you have Robbie Grossman. Travis Jankowski hasn't seen as much time recently. Uh, so Evan Carter has really pushed himself into that starting role. Started both games against the Rays in the wildcard series. I venture to guess that he'll be the starter 
uh, for game one as well for the Rangers. He's just been so red hot in the month of September, hitting over 300 with an OPS over 1,000, five homers, 12 RBI. He's been fantastic, impossible to deny. Uh, so that's the depth that uh, the Rangers have going into this one. And when the Rangers get hot, they are one of the best teams in baseball. They've shown that this season. All the Orioles have done have just consistently been one of the best teams in baseball. What are some of the biggest keys you're looking for in this series? Key number one for me is get to the bullpen. I already mentioned Adley Rutschman's walk statistics, uh, but for the entire team, getting on base is going to be absolutely huge because if you can get to this bullpen, you can likely win the game. They were really good, like I mentioned, against the Rays in that first wildcard series. But on the season as a whole, they just have not been. Shaky. Usually the biggest weakness of this Rangers team is their bullpen. 24th in the major leagues in terms of bullpen ERA, just under five as a team. And they only have one guy, Jose Leclerc, under three for an ERA. So not great. There's just not a lot of players who are incredibly effective. They have a lot of veteran talent with some big names, Will Smith in that bullpen, or oldest Chapman as well, but those guys have faltered too. So if the Baltimore Orioles can get to that bullpen, knock out the starter early, they can have a chance to win any of these games. Uh, key number two for me is get Ryan Mountcastle going. Mountcastle is going to be huge in this series because of his splits against left-handed pitchers. So many left-handed pitchers for the Rangers in this series. Mountcastle mashes against them this year. Last 10 games have been a little bit shaky, a batting average under 200 in that time, but a 338 average against lefties on the year, OPS above 1,000, 12 homers, 35 RBIs against them. If you get Mountcastle going in the middle of this lineup, it's going to be hard to stop the Orioles offense. Third one and last one for you, preserve the bullpen. That's going to be huge for the Orioles in this one. Felix Bautista going was a huge knock on what this bullpen can do, but there's tons of talent that still remains. Yenir Cano, Danny Coulomb, so many guys. CNL Perez has been huge down the stretch as well. Jacob Webb has been great every single time you put him out, but with Bautista gone, you've got one huge name that is your back-end guy. That's Yenir Cano, but you don't, might not have as much faith as other guys coming in uh, when it's a one-run game of the night, so you've got to preserve that bullpen. Well, no doubt about it, the Texas Rangers present a huge challenge. This is what the playoffs are for, as the Orioles host the Texas Rangers for ALDS Game 1 here at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. And Mass and All Access is going to have you covered all series long. Make sure you're checking out the Bird's Nest. We listened. We asked if you guys wanted to hear us before every postseason game. That's exactly what we're going to do. Make sure you join myself and Matt Bonaparte live tomorrow at 8 a.m. Set those alarm clocks. We're going to be up talking some Orioles baseball. We're going to be live on Sunday every game of this series. Make sure you're tuning in to the Bird's Nest live on YouTube and Facebook or after the fact on Spotify, SoundCloud, anywhere you can get a podcast or digital show. You can find us on the Bird's Nest. We're excited to see you here here at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. For Matt Bonaparte, I'm Brendan Mortensen. Big thank you to Amy Jennings behind the scenes. We'll catch you next time.